so Spock's like, guys, remember, on this planet, anything we think can be used against us. The choice is made. The traveler has come. Nobody choose anything. Did you choose anything? No. Did you? The line is totally blank. I didn't choose anything. Perhaps I could use this as an excuse to go to those far off planets with little polka dotted people if necessary and be able to talk about love, war, nature, God, sex, all those things that go to make up the excitement of the human condition. I'm Captain James Kirk. Captain Kirk. Kirk. Of the Starship Enterprise. And the ineluctable Mr. Spock. Mr. Spock, my first officer. Captain Dr. Spock in love. I can't imagine. Kirk. Kirk. Of the Starship Enterprise. Did I ever tell you about the time I saved Captain Kirk's life? Kirk. 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 Of the Starship Enterprise. What a blessing to be able to live one's life over again. If the life you've led has left you unfulfilled. Heldor Joy, and welcome to Humanist Trek. It's a Star Trek podcast about humanism in Star Trek. I'm Sarah Ray. And I'm Allie Ashmead. A- Allie. Uh, yeah. A- answer the, the hailing frequency. There's a call coming in. <laughs> <laughs> Subspace message from Starfleet. Switching to speaker. All right. So we have a voicemail and we love, we love, love, love getting these. So if you're out there and you want to leave us a voicemail, uh, you can do that. Yeah, thank you. The number is 920-550-TREK. That's 8735. So this one comes to us from patron and uh, friend of the show, Bruce McMillan. Let's have a listen. Hey, this is Bruce McMillan, first-time caller, long-term listener of Humanist Truck. Who knew you had a telephone number and could leave voicemail? Who knew? <laughs> Nobody. Nobody <laughs> knew we had a telephone number and could leave a voicemail. Um, hey, I just listened to the the uh, latest episode in regards to the magic of Megan Two. I think that's the title. Uh, I thought the animation on this was bonkers. I thought the story was kind of bonkers, but I did like the message and some of the things that you guys all you both pulled out. Um, my favorite part was the uh, at the end. It's like, well, what if it was Satan? And Kirk's like, well, we don't believe in that anymore. And she this is just a fellow being and to exile them would be, would have been cruel and it doesn't matter. And so that was, that was the way we we're going to do. Um, when you are all talking about some practicing Buddhist, um, and you're talking about that we need to kind of, kind of the divisions that's in, in the world right now. And I don't know if you use the word meeting in the middle. I don't agree with meeting in the middle. You know, during abolitionist, being an abolitionist, you don't meet in the middle with slave hold, slave owners. Um, so we're going to come to some middle ground. But that piece of using our own compassion to not demonize or to keep connected with them as humans um, and using our own values and their own underneath kind of values of goodness and kindness to to connect and to move things forward. I think is I really, really appreciated that. So hopefully someday meet you all in in person. And uh, yeah, obviously I like the podcast. Catch you all later. Bye. Thank you, Bruce. Oh, thanks, Bruce. That's awesome. Yeah. I love it. I love it. I, I got to tell you, I love the take on meat in the middle. And if I said that, I might have. I don't know. But your point about meeting in the middle being a, a way for some people to kind of take advantage of your your kindness and your compassion right so mm-hmm. like we try very hard not to make this a super political podcast the whole point of this was just to have fun we didn't want to talk about all the things going on in the world however i also feel like it's kind of existential right now and mm-hmm. i can't hardly get away from it so we're not going to bore you too much with with that you come here to escape like we do but the overton window has been shifting to the right and and it's it, there's probably a good piece of that meet in the middle ideology that helped contribute to that window being able to shift. Mm, uh, agree. So yeah, totally get it. Um, Thank you, Bruce. And great. yeah, maybe we will have to. We will definitely have to do some sort of meetup or something. 
or we'll just catch you out in Denver some sometime. That yeah. would be so cool. Come to Fort Collins Comic Con. Um, oh yeah. August 16th, 17th, and 18th. We'll be there. We also have a text message in our mailbag here. <laughs> a, a communication. <laughs> still, <laughs> yes. still some there, sort of subspace communication. Yes, this one is a subspace communique. Remember where it's not a live phone call? They just get a message from an admiral or whatever. They, they call mm-hmm. it a communique. I don't know who this is from, so let me know who you are so we can give you know proper attribution. This listener writes, I just listened to the podcast with the giant Spock on the plant planet. (laughs) During the game at the end, there was a question about what century we're living in. Sarah, your wife gave the wrong answer. We are absolutely living in the 21st century. The last year of a century is the year that gives the numbered year name to the century. We we live in 2024 right now, and the last year of this century is the year 2100. So that year number starts with the number 21. Therefore, we're in the 21st century. Great. Yeah. Thank you for the correction. I knew that because like uh, when we were in the 19th century, we were, we, when we were in the 1900s, we were in the 20th century. So, yeah. I just, I always find myself having to do the math. That's all. Uh, just add one. Add one. <laughs> the same thing happened when, for instance, you lived in 1964 or 1921 or 1999 or 1976, etc. The last year of that century was 2000. 2000 was the first two numbers of that century's last year, so we lived in the 20th century. That, um, hopefully, that helps someone. That that line of thinking, that like process and methodology, doesn't. My brain doesn't go, yeah, that makes sense now. (laughs) I still have to do the math. Anyway, a couple of fun things to note. There is a lot of this happening now on TikTok with the younglings. They're having a hard time wrapping their minds around the 21st century. They all seem to think we live in the 20th century. The movie company 20th Century Fox changed its name to 21st Century Fox. Mm Mm-hmm. Didn't know that. So that'll help me remember better than anything else. Honestly, I was going to say so, just a note that is how I always figured out when we were in the 1900s. That's Uh how I figured out what century we were in was because of that like little splash in front of every movie. I'm like, oh, we're in the 20th, 20th century Fox. So, yeah. Some time passes, and the same listener writes Lucian is a satyr. We mistakenly thought he was a fawn Mm -hmm. but he's a satyr Mm -hmm. okay so when you compare the two satyrs were alternatively depicted with goat's legs or horse tails satyrs were associated with gods dionysus and pan fawns were nature spirits in roman mythology Hmm. they are basically the same creatures like one is from greek and one is from roman mythology gotcha okay so there you go corrections all around Thanks, guys. I love that somebody is paying so much attention that they call us when we make a mistake. I mean, I love it. I don't mind it. I love it. I I, I don't mind it at all. It's fun. And we absolutely love hearing from you all. So definitely reach out if you have thoughts or questions. 920-550-TREK. 920-550-8735. I don't know if you noticed or not. I cut, we had a whole conversation about an upcoming trip that my family and I were going to Yellowstone for a week after my mom and sister were here. I cut that whole bit from last week's opening. Mm -hmm. And now we have to cancel our trip. We don't get to go. Sucks. Yeah. So that problem with the trailer breaks uh, has not been resolved. We took it to a place. We thought they fixed it, but they didn't. And then when I got home, I looked at the wiring and found a spot where like the shielding had come completely off and was just kind of half-ass electrical taped. And so I cut the wire back and put the thing back on thinking, aha, that was it still doesn't work. So we have no trailer breaks. And so we're not taking a two day drive to stay a week. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Oh shit. I know I'm disappointed. I was really looking forward to another like unplug vacation. Camping adventure. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh. Well, tell you who is going on vacation this week. We're back to the Alice in Wonderland planet in Star Trek, the animated series, season one, episode nine, Once Upon a Planet. 
Sir, contact with an object. It's moving toward us. No visual contact yet. Reflector is full intensity. Pursue. Yes, Captain. Anything on your scanners? It's coming at light speed. Collision course. Visual contact. Anything over? All wavelengths dominated by ionization effects, sir. All engines full stop. So for anybody who may have missed the episode of Star Trek, the original series, they do a really good job of quickly like recapping, kind of setting the stage here. McCoy, Sulu, and Uhura beam down, talking about how it's just like McCoy remembers it. And, <laughs> and, and how this is the exact same spot we beamed down to before. They're back! <laughs> <laughs> McCoy was thinking of Alice in Wonderland, and then the rabbit appeared. This is, and this is also the planet, not only where Alice in Wonderland appeared, but McCoy died. In yeah. this episode, in this last episode, too. So he missed like most of the episode because he was dead. <laughs> Sulu found a gun under a rock, too. Mm -hmm. And then there was a. Uh, there was some like World War II planes that yeah. were. Yeah. There was, it was some crazy shit happening in this episode. It was, it was fun. <laughs> to demonstrate to the new viewer, the white rabbit comes hopping through this gathering, voiced by James Doohan, and it's super late for something, of course followed quickly by Alice, voiced by Nichelle Nichols. Yeah, and Uhura just tells Alice, oh, uh, that rabbit went that way. <laughs> and then she's like, thank you, and follows. They make a really big point here about how it's exactly like before. Nothing's changed. And remember that these are highly sophisticated robots created by a highly sophisticated computer that will make whatever dream you dream come to life. So, so only think happy thoughts. Don't think of anything, you know, destructive because it will happen. Whatever we think of, if we think of J. Edgar Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover will appear and destroy us, okay? So empty your hands. Empty your hands. Don't think of anything. We've only got one shot at this. So Uhura is sitting by the lake. They all kind of like, okay, we can relax now. And Uhura is sitting by the water and humming this high-pitched hum. I, she's got a great voice, but this, this sound was, was kind of it. annoying. Yeah. This was kind of annoying. <laughs> Sulu's walking in the woods, and I think they do a dark silhouette of him just in the woods. And then McCoy comes upon this, like, colonial plantation house or something. And he's like, man, they don't make them like this anymore. So he's lamenting about this colonial plantation home and probably thinking about the good old days in the South. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Suddenly... Somebody throws an axe and lands in a tree next to him, and he hears, off with his head. <laughs> now, this is the Queen of Hearts, voiced by Majel Barrett. And two jacks next to the queen. Is two jacks and a heart, is that some sort of hand? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't play. I don't play. I don't know. Classic TAS shot of McCoy's silhouette running across the meadow, and he's on the phone with Scotty calling for an emergency beam out. <laughs> Apparently, Nine. the communicators work on, like, the old party line system because anybody in range can just listen in. And so Uhura's got her star tech out calling Scotty, too. But this robot arm, this is like... <laughs> this is like classic, like, Saturday morning cartoon animated robot arm reaches yeah. into frame and snatches her star tack. And we briefly look, see what looked to me like a large floating fidget spinner. It's some kind of drone, you know, yeah. thing, but it looks it's some sort of drone. Yeah. But so she's her communicator is snatched, but just in time, Scotty is able to transport McCoy and Sulu back to the ship to safety. And they're explaining to Kirk what happened, but Scotty calls up because he wasn't able to get Uhura beamed up, and now they've lost contact. This, oh, shit. this scene sets up very clearly that there's trouble in paradise, so Kirk cancels all the shore leave, everybody needs to beam back, and uh, then we'll have to go find Uhura, starting with finding that caretaker they met in Star Trek, the original series. For those of you who may have missed that, <laughs> that episode, uh, there's a... a living dude that runs the place and, and makes sure that the computer stays virus free. But they haven't seen him. He wasn't on the planet. So they're going to go look underground. The keeper is, yeah, his name is the keeper. And 
his duty was to ensure the safety of the visitors to make sure that their thoughts aren't going to kill them. <laughs> this underground complex has a granite and metal alloy shielding it, so they can't scan. So KSM and Sulu are going to beam down and investigate further. Meanwhile, in the underground computer room, Uhura is arguing with the computer. <laughs> it thinks the Enterprise, which it calls the Sky Machine, is Uhura's master, and for some reason, it does not want the Enterprise to leave orbit, so much so that it's willing to kill the crew. Uhura's like, I don't know if you've ever watched Star Trek before. Uh, what was your name again? Landrew? Uh, but, <laughs> but what happens next is that my captain and crewmates come looking for me, and then you're in big shit. So let's talk about the the actual computer. Yeah. Like, okay, so she's in some sort of control room underground, and there's a screen that lights up every time the this controller talks. And I'm s i am swear it looks like some kind of talking anus. Did you notice <laughs> oh, that? I did like not every get time that at it, all. I got like it, eyeball kind of Well, it it just like flashes every time it talks and it just looks like some sort of anus <laughs> talking. <laughs> So I'm going to call it the talking anus. <laughs> the compu sphincter. <laughs> compu sphincter. <laughs> God. Compu rectum. And Landry's like, oh, they're already here. Your crew's already here trying to, trying to get you. But I only need one hostage. So, uh, you know, I'm just going to turn those people off. And Ahura's like, wait, that's murder. He's like, well, if that is what that means to cease the function then yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna turn them off yeah call it whatever you want so we have ourselves another maniacal computer problem uh this shouldn't take long what's a good logic loop question we yeah, can th introduce that always that always works <laughs> so kirk and sulu and mccoy and spock are on the surface and then they do a captain's log that says, you know, we were only we were only looking for a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Dr. McCoy was inexplicably attacked. And now Uhura has been kidnapped. So Kirk's but, on the surface on the phone with Eric's on the Enterprise. Uh, no sign of Uhura on sensors anywhere on the surface. So she's definitely underground. But that pesky granite and metal alloy. Although Sulu suggests that might even be an illusion created by the planet. Ah. And this was something that I wish they had played on a whole lot more because that would have been a great, like, you can't trust anything you see. Yeah. Yeah. That could have been like the, the cloud hanging over the rest of the episode, but they didn't go that way. No. And Kirk's normal thing is to shoot it. <laughs> so he says, like, there's apparently there's this big phaser bore thing that they can do where they can concentrate the phaser from the ship and bore a hole into 20 meters of rock per minute so hey let's try that <laughs> kirk to enterprise <laughs> he calls up he calls up Mares, um on the bridge and Mares is like i know she's been on the show before but she's purring and shit a lot on this <laughs> i love she's really getting into the character of, of a cat i love this so much i was cracking up <laughs> Major was, like, doing her best to purr. Hey, do you remember when Pike and Number One had their laser blaster beamed down and they were blasting through that rock on the elevator, but the buttheads forced an yeah, illusion that made had, it? That's I thought to... that was going to happen. I thought this was going to be another, like, oh, the blaster worked, but the illusion of... Mm. I thought that would have the... been fun, too. Yeah. But so when they call up the bridge to get the phaser board down to the planet, they try to beam it down. First of all, they're trying having trouble the signals breaking up. So they feel like their signals being blocked, but they did manage to get the message to Scotty to beam down the, the phaser board. But then when they try to beam down the phaser board, they can't. So something is blocking communications and transporter. Back on the surface, Sulu spots a metal alloy structure in the trees, and the camera cuts to this thing, and all I could think was, Allie, did you happen to see there was another mysterious monolith found? I thought the same thing. <laughs> these, these monoliths 
are being put there by humans. Like yeah. one was in the Grand Canyon at some point or somewhere, and then now it's appeared somewhere in in Denver area or in Colorado. Yeah, it's like northwest of Fort Collins. And they the person removed it. They're like, let's get this shit out of here. But yeah, they yeah. <laughs> serious monolith in the middle of the, on this planet. So they go up for a closer look, and uh, it turns out this thing is a grave marker. And the inscription plate, written in several languages, including English for some reason, says, Last of his race ceased to function fifth day of the twelfth moon, year 7009 of this planet. And of course, if you read that in robot voice, it makes a lot of sense. (laughs) (laughs) Or how would they do it in TAS? Last of his race ceased to function fifth day of the twelfth moon. <laughs> that must mean the keeper is dead. And, you know, Captain Obvious McCoy says that. <laughs> and so apparently they're on their own. They don't know what they're dealing with now. Back on the bridge, since they can't beam anybody in or out, Scotty's plan is to take a shuttlecraft down to rescue them. But then they they can't even get the hangar doors open. So their ship's functions are now being affected. And Scotty's worked out that whatever's causing all these problems is coming from the planet. Since everything was working fine before they arrived, and he's already arrived at the hypothesis that the computer must have gotten a virus or something. You remember when computer viruses were just, I mean, that was every time you turned around, you were getting a fucking computer virus. Well, back in the day, it was so easy to, um, like, I'm sorry, McAfee was not cutting it back then. <laughs> and people were, like, the internet was so new. Yeah. And people were so gullible. But, you know, the hackers were way ahead of everybody and, you know, embedding shit in ads, pop-up ads and stuff. And Yeah. So, yeah. That also may speak to the amount of porn that I was consuming at that time in my life, too. I mean, because <laughs> well. that's where a lot of those viruses were. Let's be real honest. <laughs> Speaking of a computer with a virus, Uhura is trying to argue with it still to not kill the crew. And she even spots the power button on the computer. But before she can even move a muscle, uh, another comedic robot arm comes out and snatches her up by the wrists. Like, damn, it knew what she was going to do before she was doing it. And and the computer says, I monitor any thoughts that are emotionally charged as any good thought duplicator must. So, of (laughs) course, he's like, of course, I knew. I knew what you're going to do. Uhura thinks this computer sounds a little less than enthusiastic about its job. And Landrew says, my life has so far been one of service. It's time for a change. <laughs> Is this what we're so it's so it's so funny the amount of fear that people had back then, even back then in yeah. the 60s and 70s of computers taking over. And here we are living in an an era where they are ta- they've taken over yeah. and we're we're like okay with it and we're even building more computer shit to take over like ai now we're trying to have the ai mimic re- our reality and we're okay with it or mm-hmm. most of us are okay with it then we cut to an overhead shot of ksms in a clearing and i am putting money on this right now this is a shot recycled from the magics of Megas 2 episode i have seen mm-hmm. this shit before there's like a clearing in the woods Remember when um, Lucian m- magicked them into this glade? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's the shot. I have to go back and compare. It could be. Hey, it's cheaper to just reuse it. Hell yeah. And I've noticed a lot of that coming up. There's, there's mm-hmm. a couple more in this episode. Well, uh, yeah. there's really one coming up, and I know you know what I'm going to say. So this is a fun comedic bit. Kirk's talking about how, like, well, there's lots of entrances into the interior of the planet, but they're not finding them. And McCoy's, like, really cranky and says, what do you want? Signs point in the way? And sure enough, signs start popping up, pointing them to the (laughs) underground entrance. (laughs) Yeah. And he does apologize. He does snap at Sulu, but he apologizes, which is very, like uncharacteristic for McCoy of TOS to do but um but he's like I'm just worried about Uhura so sorry for snapping 
sure enough, those signs are basically telling them where to go, and they head off towards um, a cave mouth. And then <laughs> the sound is reused. Yep, absolutely. They, they have these purple pterodactyl looking things that are screeching and wings are flapping and this is the familiar sound from the infinite vulcan because of that's that stupid flapping noise oh, I hate it. kirk's like not the fucking swoopers again <laughs> oh no it's the swoopers <laughs> Gotta catch them all. Pokemon. and he spock is like was anybody thinking about pterodactyls this is great so so spock has worked out now that Landry was on the fritz and Kirk makes a comment about the planet seems to be playing cat and mouse with us and a giant orange cat appears. <laughs> so they're stuck in a cave first with the pterodactyls and now with a cat at the entrance. I needed the shot of the cat. Like, so the cat's looking into the cave and then it like sticks its paw in. Like I needed yeah. that shot. And like, yeah, like doing like that. Batting around trying to get the, <laughs> <laughs> that's hey, what i wanted hey it's a cartoon so spock's like guys remember on this planet anything we think can be used against us the choice is made whoa, whoa, whoa. the traveler has come nobody choose anything did you choose anything no did you the line is totally blank i didn't choose anything <laughs> <laughs> Back in the control room, Uhura sees everything that's happening on the screen, and she's just begging the the computer to call off the beast. Um, and why are you doing this? But he, the computer says, shut up. I've got stuff to do. <laughs> <laughs> Back in space, the Enterprise has gone haywire, zigging and zagging, and everybody's doing the jerk. And finally, Eric's is able to hit the manual override button. And they're just as suddenly back in orbit like nothing happened. The investigation of this leads Scotty to think that the planet is trying to figure out how to control the Enterprise. And there's a whole bunch of other maneuver commands just sitting in the queue like a Windows PC that just refuses to fucking recognize that printer already. <laughs> uh, luckily, though, Eric's has the navigation locked off so the Enterprise won't execute those commands anymore. So back in the cave, they don't have communication with the ship, and they can't find Uhura, and this planet is just no longer what they thought it was. Uh, the cat's gone, and they're still stuck in the cave, and they've got to figure out a way to get some answers. But Spock feels like a key to doing that lies with McCoy, because, <laughs> because the last time they were there, there McCoy was actually killed, and... They think that if if someone's killed, then the computer will take over and and try and do something to try to save the person that's killed. So that was where Spock was thinking. McCoy's like, "Don't look at me, I'm not doing it." <laughs> uh, not a real injury, though. Maybe they can fake something, uh, but it also has to appear real enough that Landry will think it's real. What else were we calling this thing? Oh, uh, the talking anus. A, oh yes, this this. Sphincter 2000. <laughs> Compy Sphincter. Compy Sphincter. Oh, God. Compy Sphincter, yeah. So now we've got to figure out a way to fake an injury to where it seems like someone's dying. And Kirk's like, surely you've got something in your black little pouch that can temporarily incapacitate somebody. And McCoy's like, something called Melanex might do the trick. Um, it causes brief unconsciousness and temporary skin <laughs> discoloration. And so Kirk sticks out his arm. He's like, okay, where do you want it? But then Spock does his thing that he always does and says, no, no, I'll do it. It, it should be me because I'm better with computers than you. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have questions. Mm -hmm. So they're assuming that because Landrew was programmed to not let anyone come to harm, that it'll detect the injury, take the person in for repair. But that ignores all this evidence they've been getting that there's something wrong with Landrew. What makes right. you and think it's going to behave as it did before? And um, it's trying to kill them. So, yeah. But but then again, I don't know. Yeah. Qu question number two: Why the fuck is McCoy carrying Melanex on an away mission in the first place? If it causes brief unconsciousness and temporary skin discoloration, 
What else is it supposed to do? Is that, a, is that the side effect? What's it supposed to cure? Why do you have it on this away mission? <laughs> it's, it's for the episode, you know. Uh, I don't know. Who course. knows what else he's got in his bag, so. What you got in that bag? What in the world is in that bag? What you got in that bag? <laughs> Spock volunteers. He's got more computer knowledge. And then uh, McCoy says... Yeah, and his tough Vulcan hide also for for another. I'm like, okay, stop it. Right. Kirk agrees, and he's like, go ahead. So McCoy hits Spock with his hypo, adding that he'll be unconscious for less than five minutes, and Spock goes outside the cave and collapses. Very dramatic. Mm -hmm. Little drama queen there, Spock. <laughs> Back on the bridge. <laughs> <laughs> Mares Mares reports that there's no word from the uh, the away team, and Scotty tells her to keep trying. Everybody's um, like floating around the bridge in zero gravity. The computer is still fucking with the ship, <laughs> trying to figure out how to control it, and he's turned off the uh, the gravity. I think that'd be fun. M what? Maybe as long as you get to hold on to something, because otherwise you're just. You're floating. Have you ever thought about doing the plane thing where they take you up and do the zero G thing and you float for a certain amount of time? I don't know. If, I mean, I think that costs a lot of money. <laughs> well, uh, sure. <laughs> I don't know. I just think it'd be fun. I've done the, um, I don't know if you've done the iFly before, which no. is that skydiving indoor. That was fun. That I did a long too, yeah. time ago in Orlando and um, it was scary as shit. <laughs> Uh, but I did it. I did it. It was very, it was scary. So I imagine that's kind of probably what it feels like. Scotty's able to grab a hold of the big chair and call up Gabler in engineering, which I will remind you, this was a white dude the last time we saw him. Not this week. He has this ability to, to just change colors. Maybe he's some sort of alien. <laughs> <laughs> so Gabler's floating around engineering, unable to access the gravity controls. Again, something jamming the hatch. Back in the cave, Sulu's like, okay, it's been five minutes. And McCoy's thinking, well, maybe the compu sphincter is on to us. <laughs> so we're just going to wait a little bit longer. But sure enough, the rock opens, this drone comes out, and it is about to grab Spock. Kirk's plan is to follow the mechanical nursemaid into the rock behind him. But when the device picks up Spock, they all try to dash for it, but only Kirk makes it. So McCoy and Sulu are left like back outside to deal with the. So now it's <laughs> now it's a Hydra. Now it's some sort of dragon, fire breathing, two headed dragon. And McCoy's like, did you think of that? I couldn't help it. It just popped in there. What? What just popped in there? I, I, I tried to think. Look! No! It can't be. What is it? It can't be. What did you do, Ray? Oh, shit. He's like, Solo. He's like, it wasn't me. <laughs> I swear it wasn't me. And from this point on, we are into that classic TAS Act 3 quick back and forth as the story starts to get tied up. Yep. So Kirk is following the fidget spinner carrying Spock, which places Spock on a table with a glass dome. We've been doing that a lot lately, too. What's up with the little glass enclosed tables? Yeah, underground, um, because the infinite Spock did the same. That was yeah. the same thing. So yeah. Spock is like, man, this sounds, this feels familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Are you leaving my brain intact this time? Brain and brain, what is brain? Spock wakes up just in time, but Landrew detects him and then detects Kirk, too, as they run for cover. They go through a hall or doorway of some kind, and it's too narrow for the fidget spinner, so it just smashes into the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, um, Sulu and McCoy are just trying to stay alive <laughs> as the Hydra is, like, incinerating everything. Smash cut back to the control room. Kirk starts interrogating, and we finally learn the whole thing. Landrew is tired of being a toy for travelers visiting the planet providing for their amusement. It wants to be free from that mindless servitude, and all this time it's been growing in power, intelligence, and need. And what it needs right now is a starship to get the fuck off this planet and go look for other supercomputers. It's, it's brothers. It's family. 
it's brother anuses i don't know brother <laughs> sphincters yeah it just wants to be free and travel the galaxy kirk's like oh man if i had a dollar for every fucking crazy computer like you that we've run into yeah there's a lot of your brothers out there <laughs> Hey, do you remember in the first episode of Star Trek, the animated series, how Melvar just wanted to leave the planet and escape loneliness, and we just mm -hmm. fucking dipped and left him there? Mm-hmm. Any bets on how this is going to go down? <laughs> yeah, I initially I'm just thinking, I, I just figured it's going to be some sort of logic loop again. Smash cut the engineering really quickly. Scotty uses a crowbar to uh, open the computer bay hatch. And inside, he finds an entirely new computer station has appeared out of nowhere. And he can't touch it because it lights him up when he tries. <laughs> we also see the answer to this week's Starfleet Academy Cadet Challenge that I cannot fucking believe we didn't think of this, Allie. On the bridge, they're all wearing seat belts to keep from floating around in the zero G. Damn I'm... it. Motherfucker. Seat belts. Come on. Oh. And I know people at home were listening to us going, what the hell, you guys? <laughs> I missed it. I mean, yeah, yeah, I did, too. Sulu and McCoy are trapped by the dragon at a dead end, so they better get to solving this shit fast. Uh, no, no logic loop trickery this week, just a sound logical argument. They explain that the humans created the starship, which Landru assumes to mean that people are the master and the ship is the servant. And Landry's like, no fucking way. I did my own research, which means I follow a YouTuber. Uh, and machines <laughs> are superior to men. Therefore, machines must rule the galaxy. Kirk's like, whoa there, buddy. Nobody needs to be ruling anything. Uh, men and machines coexist, uh, help each other. Landry's like, what? It comes as a shock to CompuSphincter. But Ahura, I don't know how I feel about this when she says this. That there's no shame in serving others when one does it of his own free will. But then she goes, you've got a marvelous capacity to provide happiness for others. A rare talent you should cherish and use. I have some issues with, with that. Yeah. But, but they're basically trying to get him to consider that maybe stop being evil. <laughs> and um, you can learn from all the species that you encounter on the planet. And... It, they can entertain you without you having to travel the galaxy. And with that, Landru agrees with this logic and releases control of the Enterprise. Everything goes back to normal. The dragon disappears. And Landru invites the crew to stay as guests, provided they can have more of these logical, philosophical conversations, which Kirk voluntells Spock to do. Yeah. And Spock says, yeah, I'll, I'd find it interesting to do that. Shore leave is back on, and Spock points out that some of the crew have already begun that shore leave, as we see McCoy and Sulu sitting on the blanket having a picnic with Alice, the white rabbit, and the giant two-headed dragon. And they all lived happily ever after, off to the Seriously? next adventure. <laughs> oh my God. Boy, I'm sure glad that's over with. I'm happy the affair is over. Me too! A most annoying, emotional episode. Yeah, but you know, I learned something today. When dreams become more important than reality, you give up travel, building, creating. One jealous god, if all this makes a god. By sparing your helpless enemy, who surely would have destroyed you, you demonstrated the advanced trait of mercy. Frankly, I was rather dismayed by your use of the term half-breed. You must admit, it is an unsophisticated expression. I don't know i mean i was like is was this episode just for fun um it, it felt a lot that way but but yes i had feelings at the end there too you start so the whole thing where uh Aurora was saying like there's no shame in serving others when one does it of his own free will that's true that's true but then she has to she still sort of in a way imprisons the computer and says well you've got this ability so you should do this don't tell people or things what they should do just because they have the ability to um, mm -hmm. make other people happy. I feel like that in itself is a little bit of a bondage in a way. What I heard when I heard that exchange was 
yeah, you're a slave and you want your freedom, but you know, they take good care of you're fed, right? Yeah, you've got a safe yeah. place to sleep. You're fed. You're taken care of. You, you want to stay, don't you? No, what man, I want to be free. Why are you trying to talk me into staying here? That's what mm-hmm. I heard. And all, yeah. And also um, Spock was in on it too. He's like, well, you can just stay here and learn everything about all these species instead of traveling the galaxy like mm-hmm. you really want to because you want to be free. So I, I don't know. I, I had a problem with, with that. I, I did too. And beyond that, I don't know what I took away other than, you know, we were, it was a, this was another one of those triple episodes, the, you know, the, the beloved original series episode and like, wouldn't we be fun to play in that sandbox again? So we wrote a fun episode to go play on the Pleasure Planet. Yeah, this was a sequel to a shore leave, and they had another sequel, another continuation in the in the pipeline, but they never released it. Oh, um, well, that so would have yeah. been interesting to see. I, I wish like they had done more with this episode than a rogue computer. Um, I think there was opportunity to do more with it than just a rogue computer because they could have like encountered someone else um, that was there for a vacation, and then that person was evil, and they were using their their own things that were conjured up to, you know, attack the the Enterprise crew. I don't know. There could have been to so much, but hey, that's it, fine. Yeah. I just, I, I, I try to think when I get to the end of these, and I struggled uh, with the next couple of them, I think. Mm-hmm. Okay, I, I'm, a, I'm a 10-year-old on Saturday morning watching cartoons. What am I supposed to get out of this? What, what's, you know, what's the message that, because this is, this mm-hmm. is kind of what we're trying to do here, I think. You know, like all good cartoons past Looney Tunes were uh, tried to have a, a message or a moral or a theme or a lesson of some kind. A lot of cartoons did that. So, like, what what is it in this episode? And I don't. Yeah. Other than the fact that I just did not agree with with the them way they resolved the... it. Yeah. 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 You stay in your box, your computer, you stay in your box. You don't get to explore the galaxy. And maybe that last moment could have, you know, instead of the comedic bump bump, we're having a picnic, right? And maybe this is the difference between the animated series and what they might have done live action. But maybe that last beat is that we're left feeling sorry or bad for the sphincter tron 2000 in <laughs> in some way right yeah. that, that we should we should feel a, a beat of wow starfleet just made the wrong call and mm-hmm. and that kind of sucks for landrew having to you know be stuck here after all i don't know and, and the the way they want him stuck there because they need him for vacation right. you know and, you know that it's a very selfish human thing the reason that they came to that is, oh, well, your computer, your function is here. Even though you have evolved, we still need you to facilitate our vacation. So, no, you can't leave. Yeah. That kind of thing. And, I, yeah, I wasn't too happy with it. Yeah. Let's get right to business. I and I'm authorized to pay an equitable price. Federation has invested a great deal of money in our training. They're about due for a small return. Listen, we pay our percentages. We're entitled to a little service for our money, eh? Is this the way your citizens do business? The right of petition? They pay their percentages and the boss takes care of them. (laughs) (sighs) Is there anything else? All right. So we want to thank all of our patrons. We especially want to thank our founding admirals, Russell, Ali, Peter, Sarah, and Sherry. Greetings, savvy profit seekers of the Alpha Quadrant. Your ears have stumbled upon the lucrative opportunity of a lifetime. Humanist Trek. Now, don't just stand there like a packwood waiting for enlightenment. Let's talk business. First, unleash your linguistic prowess and leave us a review. It's like planting the seeds of profit in the fertile soils of the podcasting market. Smart, right? Now, for those truly desiring a spot in the Ferengi Hall of Commerce, Consider becoming a patron. It's not charity. It's an investment in the future of comedic prosperity. Early access, exclusive profit branded merch, and bonus content so valuable, you'll feel like you discovered a cache of hidden gold breast latinum. Don't be a rule of acquisition violator. Head to patreon.com slash humanist track and pledge as low as $3 a month. The return on your investment? Priceless laughter. 
and the satisfaction of knowing you're supporting the galaxy's next big profit venture. Profit is our mission, and with your help, we'll be laughing all the way to Grand Nagus' bank. Let me remind you that taking business advice from a female is a violation of Ferengi law. Shame on you! I hope you're satisfied. I assume you're loitering around here to learn what efficiency rating I plan to give your cadets. Trainees, to the briefing room. Is that all you got to say? What about my performance? Aren't you dead? I don't believe this was a fair test of my command abilities. There was no way to win. There's no correct resolution. It's a test of character. Now, what is that supposed to mean? I am understandably curious. May I ask you a question? Who's been holding up the damn elevator? Becca has returned for the answer to this week's Starfleet Academy cadet challenge question that's a lot of words for once upon a planet remind us what our question was what extremely rare for trek safety mechanism is shown in this episode we both feel like complete fucking idiots as you should <laughs> incorrect it's seat belts of course jeez <laughs> yep. come on Sorry you didn't figure that out last week before you finalized your <laughs> stupid, weird answers. I, the fun- Allie, literally, her answer was something to do with the transporter. <laughs> he couldn't even I, put, a, put a... I couldn't. I, I, <laughs> no. Oh, my God. Um, yes, this is one of the very few times that a Federation starship is shown to be equipped with seatbelts. A common sense precaution whose absence has long puzzled fans. Yeah. Um, yeah. Perhaps the well, only have- other time was in a deleted scene from Star Trek Nemesis. Mm. They have inertial dampers, right? So right. they don't need them. <laughs> but, but, Except but, they get thrown across the bridge all yeah, the damn time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, but they do the jerk all the time. All the so time. I don't understand it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, <laughs> God, don't we feel stupid. I honestly thought they're going to get this. It's so obvious they're going to get it. And then yeah. and the the best thing for me was I figured it out, not while watching the episode. I figured it out while editing last week's episode, <laughs> listening to us talk through it again. And then I was like, oh, fuck, Allie, we fucking missed it. I know where and, it is now. Oh, shit. How could we not have thought of that? And then shit. I was like, God damn it, Becca. <laughs> Like, how uh, would, we, would we know that? Yeah. Well, you know. All right. Next week, we'll be reviewing Star Trek, the animated series, season one, episode 10, Mud's Passion. Space con artist Harry Mud returns selling a fake love potion. <laughs> I've said this before. I love Harry Mud episodes. As a, I just love him as a character. I love how they brought him back in New Trek. I really enjoy Harry Mud, but I don't remember this episode. What's our question for Mud's Passion? Who provided the voice for Harry Mud in this episode? James Doohan. <laughs> no, actually, no. It no, was it's not. Guy. It was the original guy because we talked about the problem's going to be that I won't remember his name. Do we need to know his name or we just say the, the guy that was originally Harry Mud? Can we just say that? We you can say whatever you want, and then oh. when it comes time to give you the answer, I'll decide whether or not you got it right. What a bitch. <laughs> wow. Well, wow. if I say yes or no, then I give away the answer, don't I? It was the original actor. Yeah, it was the original No, guy. it's not James Dewan. Because we talked about there were three. There were three actors who, who reprised their role on TOS. He was one of them, and everybody else is played by Jimmy Dewan, Nichelle Nichols, and Major Barrett. Major Barrett. So, yeah. Yeah. The original actor, final answer, locking it in. Yep. yep. And if you want to play along, you know how to do that. Head out <laughs> to your social media, share the episode, use the hashtag Starfleet Challenge. We'll pick out a winner. Next time on Humanist Trek, Star Trek the Animated Series, Season 1, Episode 10, Mud's Passion. Diff Tour. <laughs> Smooth ma. Kapla. Humanist Trek is available wherever you replicate your podcast. Follow us on all the social medias at Humanist Trek. Become a patron at patreon.com slash humanist trek. Open hailing frequencies to podcast at humanist trek.com and visit our website, humanist trek.com. Humanist Trek is a production of Sarah Austin Media.